Miss Buteau, can you describe what happened when you last saw your father? Well, when I last saw my father, they weren't telling us that it would be our last meeting. In fact, they had asked both my mother and myself to come, so naturally our suspicions were aroused. So we asked them, well, is this the last meeting? And they said, well, it could be, it couldn't be. And I said, what do you mean, it could be or it couldn't be? It either is or it isn't. Well, receiving rather vague answers, I decided to say I was sick and I could not go. This was on April 2nd. And they sent the jail doctor who checked me up. And he went away. He said she's got an upset dummy, which I did have. And so we started to feel a bit better because we said that um, it couldn't be true. Maybe we were getting nervous, jumpy. And uh, otherwise they would have taken us. They don't care about our health. They never have in the past. So the next day they came again, though. And they said, you have to come for your last meeting. I didn't say it was the last meeting. They said, both of you come because you're better now, aren't you? The doctor gave you some tablets. So I said, yes. But we got a message across to my lawyers in the meantime. Before the doctor had come, I said, they're calling us for our last meeting. So and what happened when you went to the prison? They weren't telling us there either. And we weren't sure. We were so confused till we got to the death cell. And my father said, so both of you have come together. And we said, yes. And he said, this means it's the last meeting. And both of us started to speak and then paused. And he said, well, it is. So he said, they're not telling us. He summoned the jail superintendent and said, I have a right to know. The jail superintendent prevocated, but the force of my father's personality was such that finally he said that, yes, sir, it is. I was standing behind the jail superintendent because in front of the cell, there was only place for one person really to sit. Two could sit uncomfortably. He was behind the bars on the other side. So he said, I see. Good. And um, what time? And the jail superintendent said 4.30. He said, I hope I can have more time with my family. So he said, no, sir, it's still half an hour. So he said, that's, you know, contrary to the jail regulations, I know there's no such thing as a jail manual, but if this is my last meeting, I insist on having at least an hour. And so then we sat there, and it was horrible. My, I mean, now when I look back on it, my father was very calm, and he talked to family matters. He talked to party matters, and I keep seeing his face. They asked, at the end of the meeting, I said that I'd like to hug my father goodbye. He'd been the president, the prime minister. He brought them back from the camps of India. They wouldn't even open the cell doors for me to kiss him goodbye. And then we just went back and started the countdown to death. Nobody else knew. Nobody else was aware. It was, he didn't take, he didn't even keep a book with him. I'd taken some books with me. He had no paper and pencil. They'd taken that away a week ago. I said, please keep something, you know, you'll have something to read. And he said, no, I have my thoughts. My thoughts will keep me till the time comes. And uh, he wanted to keep Shalimar. It's a perfume by Guerlain, which he'd always worn. And he said, I want to keep some of that. And we had it with us. We gave it to him. And he said that I'll go out looking clean and I'll be smelling nice because it's a beautiful world. It's a beautiful earth and I'll be part of the land and I'll be part of its myth, its legend. And I'll go back home to my people, go back where I belong. It was just that he was so calm and I don't know how he must have been feeling. I I'm sorry to remind you about this. Did he or you really believe that then that the sentence was going to be carried out? Yes, I did. Because my father had been preparing me for two years. He kept saying they were going to kill him, but nobody believed it. They were all taken by the judicial facade. And he kept saying, but you don't understand. I have been deceived by General Zia al -Haq. I know the kind of man he is. I wouldn't have appointed him chief of army staff if I had known. I know the kind of deception he weaves. I can see it. I can recognize it. And then about three weeks or four weeks before the assassination, I was in his death cell. I was saying, no, no, it's not going to happen. And he said, well, he smiled and he said, when have I ever been wrong? And he recounted to me each phase of the trial. And then I just burst out crying. And I said, oh, and he said, don't be upset. At least I'll be free. What was his last word? What, what, what was his last message his to last you? His last words was he said goodbye to us at the death cell. What I remember was, this is goodbye until the final meeting. And those were the last words he spoke to either my mother or myself. How were you officially informed of his death? How did you learn of it? By the radio. 
the next morning uh, the staff came in they wanted to find out about food who could think of food at a time like that we said no food you know they're going to they must have assassinated chairman and they broke down and started crying because we hadn't even told them about it they went out and started crying and we waited and waited till it was announced on the radio and what happened then and then we just sat there there was nothing to do but sit and if that wasn't so bad it was the waiting before when you said 8 hours 7 hours 6 hours you kept thinking what is he doing that was the horrible part then at 2 o'clock we couldn't bear it anymore we didn't know they would assassinate him at 2 we'd been told 4:30 and we expected um, we expected them to take us for the body because we made a request to that effect so we thought, said let's go to bed we need a couple of hours of sleep both my mother and I woke up she woke up at 4:20 I woke up at 4:30 and we could stay up after that but it wasn't so bad as before the last hours countdown I mean I never knew I'd be so involved in a countdown to life and he was so brilliant he had so much vision he talked so beautifully when he would talk it would be like poetry and I just couldn't believe that you can just snuff out just snuffing out brilliance it's unbelievable well I don't want to say much I came just to tell you that uh, of course it's a personal tragedy and they've tried to break uh, our father, they've tortured him for two years. They couldn't do that. They tried to ruin his political name and now they've killed him. We have nothing to be ashamed of. They have buried a martyr today. When did you first hear the news? Four o'clock in the morning. How do you feel about not being at the funeral? Uh, terrible, naturally. Uh, uh, terrible, horrible. There's been a great deal of international pressure on General Zia to re reprieve your father. Uh, were you surprised it went ahead? Sure. They've shown they're capable of anything. The military has shown they're capable of doing anything. What reaction would you expect in, in Pakistan now? I honestly don't know. It's, uh, I wouldn't like to comment on that. My mother and sister are there still. And we just do not know what, uh, what the conditions are with them. What would you say was your father's achievement as a, as a politician and a man? He saved Pakistan from the ashes after the 1971 Bangladesh war. He gave our country freedom and a political awareness. And he gave our country democracy and social and economic and, uh, justice.